Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO of Unite Square Hospitality and Shake Shack, Danny Meyer, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here, brother. No, you didn't hear me. I said it's Danny Meyer, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Have a seat, Danny. Danny, thanks for joining us. Oh, what a pleasure. What a great crowd. <laughs> what an amazing crowd. I've been, I've been soaking up this energy, and it's just like... <laughs> well, you got some energy. I mean, the, the number, what, 50 restaurants do you have? Different chains now, is that correct? Uh, one chain called Shake Shack, but everything else is a, is a restaurant, yeah. Yeah, it's wild, and, you know... The way you've differentiated to become, have the kind of impact you have across all these different restaurants blows us away. And you're doing things, as you said, about what people feel. But maybe tell us where that feeling comes from. You don't want to serve like that. I know you're from St. Louis, Missouri originally. How was the way you were raised? Anybody from St. Louis out there? All right. For how was the way you were raised, how did that affect your philosophy of food and restaurants? I'm curious to start with. I think it affected me in so many ways. The first thing is I love food and, and I love stuff that you put in the glass, too, of almost every stripe. And growing up in St. Louis, honestly, it, during my era, the food was okay, but it was really the way the restaurants made you feel that made me love going out to restaurants. I love the fact that this restaurant, when I was a kid, I was a nobody, it's like, seat that kid under the cuckoo clock because he's always happy there, yeah. right? And this other restaurant, I always remember my dad's favorite dish and my mom's birthday, and that stuff really stuck with me. And then when I moved to New York, uh, when I was in my early 20s, the food was amazing in New York, but they treated you really poorly. <laughs> and it was kind of like this era right after the uh, red velvet rope nightclub era yeah. where the... the the most popular restaurants were the ones that treated you the worst. And I didn't understand that. And I kind of just said, why not bring what I loved from growing up back home? Yeah. Whoever wrote the rule that great food isn't going to taste better just because you're being treated nicely. Yes. What, what was the first breakthrough for you? You started 27 years old. So you started kind of with this philosophy. I know I read somewhere you said people are wearing a T-shirt that says, uh, show me I'm important. I'm paraphrasing. But... Tell me about philosophy and how it went into your first restaurant before it expanded. Well, well before I got into the restaurant business, when I was 20, my dad's tr when my dad had a travel business where he was selling group tours uh, throughout Europe. And uh, my brother, sister, and I, when we each turned 20, got to pick a country. I picked Rome, which is a country. Actually, I picked... <laughs> and, uh, I was the guy that would go pick up a cranky group of Americans at the Rome airport at 8 in the morning. They hadn't slept all night. Put them on the bus, get on the microphone and say, you're not allowed to drink this water. Be careful about not getting your pocket picked, etc. And I had this crazy reason that I was going to take the crankiest person on day one and turn them into the happiest person by day five. Love it. And the, the more I did that... I kept, I kept getting tips, and, and I kind of liked it. I kind of liked taking something that made me feel good, yeah. that made other people feel good, and making money from it. How did you do that? How did you take the person who was most cranky and turn them into one of the happiest ones over those couple Well, of I think the same way that, that you were just saying is, is that everyone truly is walking around with this sign, this invisible sign around their neck that says, make me feel important. But the thing is... It's invisible, so you can't see quite how brightly lit it is, and you can't see the font size. But the biggest thing I, I learned how to do was to read the subtitle, because every one of those signs has a subtitle that starts with the word by. So make me feel important by leaving me the hell alone. Make me feel important by letting me tell you everything I know. Let make me feel important by just listening to me. And, and I feel like that it's an amazing gift in business Yes. to be able to understand that, that you know, we've got this expression, the golden rule. I used to think that that's, that's what I did, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But I think in all these years, I've learned that there is a golden rule of hospitality, which is do unto others as you believe they would want done unto them. Yes. And you've got to be able to read their sign because not everybody wants it the same way.
I was, uh, you remind me, I was talking with a gentleman who started MTV and at one point he took over Six Flags Magic Mountain and he told me that he did this initial lecture where he told everybody in the company, he said, we're gonna compete with Disney and people were like, we're not gonna compete with Disney, this guy's insane. And he said, but Disney has a rule. Within you get within five feet, you must make eye contact. When you get within three feet, you say one of these three or four things, you must treat them well. He goes, I want you to treat people like their family. And he said, one day he was out and this woman had a young child, four or five years old, and he took his ice cream and slammed it on the concrete and threw it everywhere, splattered it everywhere. And the janitor came over and started screaming at the kid and the mother. And he neatly stepped in, separated them out, I was trying to figure out what the hell did he turn him. I thought we said we're gonna treat people like family, so that's what I would do. <laughs> so your point's well taken. It's not how we wanna be treated, it's how they wanna be treated. You know, you have this term that you call enlightened hospitality. And it's really kind of the, the core of what you do with fine casual dining, I think is the language I, heard, I read that you utilize. Tell us a little bit about what is that? What is enlightened hospitality and how do you really deliver it when you scale a business? Yeah, it's that's easy to do when you're doing one. Tony, right? that's, that's probably the biggest challenge that makes me excited to come to work every single day. First of all, what is hospitality? Hospitality, it's not just what you get for Thanksgiving or you know whatever holiday from your from your grandmother, yeah. how many of you out here are in the hospitality business? Raise your hand. Wow, quite a few. I totally disagree. Everyone, you should be raising your hand. Do it right now. <laughs> Every single one of us is in the hospitality business because there's this thing we do, but that only gets you to the 49 yard line. Whatever your card says, you do get you to the 49 yard line. You want to get all you want to get all hundred yards. The 51 extra yards come from how you make people feel while you're doing that incredible thing you do. That's hospitality. And I think that we are all so focused on performance, which is great. I don't want to tell you performance isn't crucial. If, if you don't perform beautifully, you're just nowhere. You're not even at the starting gate. Yeah. But there are so many companies that can now do what you do yes. because the word gets out, they can copy it. Exactly right. What does that leave you with? That leaves you with hospitality. How did you make all of your stakeholders feel? Now, who are your stakeholders? And this is what enlightened hospitality means. Every single one of us has the exact same five stakeholders, but each one of us also gets to pick in which order are we going to prioritize them. And all my life growing up from my family in St. Louis, I heard, Customers always right, customers always first. And that, that got me kind of far. Then I took a class, of, I took one economics class in, in college, and we were studying this guy, Milton Friedman, from the University of Chicago, who said, nope, the investor is always first, because if you make every decision on behalf of the investor, everything works out. And I'm you know, just completely conflicted in my brain, because what I realized we were doing, when I sat down to write Setting the Table, I said, we've screwed this up. We actually put the customer second. We put, of all of the five stakeholders, we put our team first, our customers second, our community third, our suppliers fourth, and our investors fifth. And we did that not because we didn't want to have really happy customers and not because we didn't want to make our investors a lot of money. We actually are selfish, and we think that if you start a virtuous cycle where one good thing keeps leading to something even better, well, of course you're going to not put your investors first. Yes. Because that'll be the smallest thing at that point. Yes. And what we learned is that our guests in all of our restaurants are never any happier coming to dine with us than our staff members are going to work. And so that's where it had to start. So th this is what we do right now. And, and something that I, I'm just devoting my career to is this. Whether or not you eat at McDonald's, I think you would have to acknowledge that there's probably never been a food business that has better scaled systems for how to do the thing you do. You can get a French box of French fries anywhere in the world, and it's going to taste the same. And I think that's, that's been a remarkable achievement of its own. And I think the thing that I want to devote our purpose to is, can you scale a feeling? Can you scale hospitality? Can you make it so that while that burger or that rack of barbecued ribs or whatever, or the black truffle in the chicken, whatever it is you're eating, that has to taste consistently good. But how can you now say, and while you're eating it, you're gonna feel treated consistently well? Yes. And that's the thing that I'm devoted to. Tell me uh, two things, if you would. 
One is, I know you have a hiring philosophy where you, I think you call it the 51%, if I'm not confusing it, where you're putting those human skills first, that intellectual, emotional fitness and psychological fitness ahead. How do you pick those people? How do you know? And then secondly, how do you nurture your employees so that that scale actually occurs? There's one thing to have the intention, but when you have, what, now 900, and, how many employees do you have just at Shake Shack? You have 2,000 just at Shake Shack. We have 2,500 out before Shake Shack. Shake Shack's probably got over 4,000 wow. at this point. So. And that's the key thing, and, and you're asking the right question because you get feeling from people. You don't get feeling from things. Yes. And so we were able to identify six emotional skills that are always present at a very, very high level in someone who's got what we call having a high HQ, people who are gonna really fulfill that last 51% for you. Yes. And a high HQ hospitality quotient, if you've got an H, a high HQ, you're probably somebody who is happier yourself when you make someone else feel better. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, you guys like to hug around here, right? Well, <laughs> hugging is probably the biggest expression of hospitality. The only way to get a hug is to give one first, unless you're dealing with a tree or something. It doesn't work that way. So we have found that the kind of the six emotional skills that are always present at a high level are kindness and optimism. That's no, that's I get a twofer on that one. Mm -hmm. Skeptics and cynics don't tend to really care that much about how they make people feel. Number two, intellectual curiosities. Number three, work ethic. Number four, empathy. That shouldn't come as a surprise. Number five, self-awareness, knowing what your own personal weather report is on any given day, because hospitality is a team sport and you will infect your team one way or the other. Yeah. And I bet you can guess the sixth one, integrity, having the judgment to do the right thing, even when it may not be in your own self-interest. Mm. So we go into all of those in depth. Um, I don't know how to teach any of them. I don't. I don't know how to no. teach you to be kind if you're not kind. I agree. But what we can do is we can teach people on our team how to interview for those emotional skills. And we can also teach our leaders how to celebrate those emotional skills. How many of you have had a job where the thing you got bonused on was something that could be measured? Cost control, higher sales, whatever. How many of you have ever had a job where you got bonused for how you made people feel? We need to see a whole lot more hands go up if this country is going to lead the, continue to lead the way in this hospitality economy. Are there, are you watching, uh, I remember I, I interviewed some people at Southwest Airlines, there was a point when they had the worst ratio of uh, approval for the stewardesses and stewards. And um, I talked with a gentleman who turned that around and the way he did it was, it wasn't by the interview, they did group interviews. And during the group interview, the person would come on stage and have to say why they should be selected above everyone else. But what they didn't realize is they weren't judging the speaker, they were judging the listeners. Because Southwest had people would sit down, barely take care of you, and walk themselves up. And if you wanted something, how to undo their belt, they'd get all pissed off. And they're watching the people, they're cheering for the person they're competing with. How do you find these mm -hmm. qualities? Is it behavioral that you're noticing? Is it something you're seeing by talking to people in their past? Or is it things that just show up during the interview itself or all the above? I'm curious. Well, they definitely don't tend to show up on a, a two-dimensional piece of paper, also yes. known as an application. Yes. So the interview is absolutely the first cue. I wouldn't say to you, hey, Tony, tell me about your work ethic. Yeah. I've got a great one. Yeah. No, but I'm going to be able to tell based on the way you present yourself. Did you, did you do any research on the company? What kind of questions are you asking, et cetera? But to your point about Southwest Airline, every two weeks to this day, I conduct a meeting with anyone in our company who has been hired within the past two weeks. Wow. And what I'm doing is, while people think I'm putting it out there to them, I'm really, really taking it in. And I promise you, in every single session, we call it new hire orientation, let's say there's 20 or 30 people in the room, there's always two people in the room who either I've put to sleep or they put themselves to sleep, because this stuff just isn't jazzing them. And so what I tell them, using this, funnily enough, an airplane metaphor, yes. is to say, you ever been on an airplane and the first thing that the flight attendant says is, you know, if Palm Beach wasn't your destination, now would be a good time to get off the airplane. <laughs> well, basically, that's what I say to people. And I say, look, I've told you where we're going. That's my job as the boss. 
but you're the passenger. Your life is so much more important to you than this company. And it, this would be a good time to get off the airplane if, it, if this doesn't jazz you. And then I actually invite people. I said, if you're feeling that way, I have no sympathy for you if when you wake up tomorrow morning, you look yourself in the mirror, that you're just doing time here because you do not need this job. There are many other jobs you could have out there. Tony Shea at Zappos actually, yes, have a hand for that for starters. I think you know what I'm Tony Shea at Zappos has a process a little different, but it's similar. Hey. The idea that they go out and they train like crazy. It sounds like you know Tony's approach. And he actually offers them money to leave. It's, I think it's three weeks, if I remember right. I, I try to do it on the cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, how do you create that? Okay, you're selecting well. I get that's the most important part. I've shared with the group here. It's great people are found and then trained, not just trained. So I think we're aligned in that. But how do you keep that culture alive when it's scaling so large? Like, what do you do for the employees? employees to make them feel like they're first? Well, before, before there's anything we do for the employees, it's what can they do for each other? And we tell every single person who works on our team that your highest priority is how you treat each other. You yourself need to be the single highest reason that all of the rest of your colleagues want to come to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if hospitality is a team sport, why is it that, that uh, baseball players leave, leave home and they don't go, hey, honey, I'm going to work? You're going to play. You're yeah. going to win. Yeah. And I want, I want a team of people that are most excited to go be on that team because someone or some other people on the team, that, let, let's face it, you've got one of the greatest tribes in the world out here, which I'm incredibly impressed with. Come on, bring it up here. <laughs> Whoa. 67 countries, three languages Whoa. translated. So now, I, I like pushing that button. That was fun. <laughs> that was a fun but what I, what I was going to say is, what I was going to say is that of all of the tribes in our lives, whether it's your tribe or whether it's your family, work is pretty high up there. The, where you go to work is one of your tribes. And I'd say the biggest thing that any tribe has is a common language. Yes. And I think that words are the most powerful mortar between the bricks of any culture whatsoever. So in addition to saying it's, your, it's, not, it's not Danny's job to make you happy, I can't. You know, I've, I've got to work on myself all the time. Yeah. What I can do is provide a platform where I think you can do your best work. And I can do that by making sure that if on this team we're always going to draft the most talented players mm. on the field who are also the most fun people to sit in the dugout with. That's awesome. And just one quick thing. Think about baseball for a minute. Think about a sport where every single thing is measured. There's percentages for throwing and fielding and, and hitting and who did, how did you hit against a left-hander and a right-hander. Why don't we have any statistics for who are you on the, in the dugout? Half of a nine-inning game is spent sitting with your team, and you are actually actively motivating everybody even when you're not on the field. And that's something that I really think this 51% is about. And how do you inspect that? How do you support that organizationally? You just have strong enough leaders at each location? Do you personally inspect it? Is there a team that goes through it? Every, everybody's scale? held accountable for, for family values. And I think all of us grew up with family values. We all grew up with a family culture. I, I always kind of laugh when I hear someone say, we got to work on having a culture around here. You have a culture whether you work at it or not. Yeah. The question is, is it intentional? And is it uplifting? So a culture is just a fancy word for how we do things around here. And so the way that, the way that we really, really watch, we actually pulse our staff from time to time and give them the opportunity to say, how does it feel to work here right now? And we listen. And sometimes you hear the same themes that you've been hearing for 15 years. That's on me when that happens. Sometimes you'll, you'll find that one restaurant is in a really, really good morale swing and another one is, is kind of floundering a little bit. So in the same way that we take the temperature every single day and yeah. we look at the temperature tomorrow and decide what we're going to wear, you got to do that with how things are feeling around your business as well. And when you're dealing with those soft skills, how do you intervene when it's not where you want it to be? I think you hold people accountable to the family values. Now, what is a family value and what is a culture? None of it 
is a way to tame the ocean of its waves. The waves are going to keep coming, but when you have a mirror, so for example, our family values are excellent, doing the thing you do as well as you can possibly do it, and figuring out how to do it even better tomorrow, honoring the work you did yesterday because you're a human being. Number two, hospitality. That was a big surprise. Doing the thing you do in a way that makes other people feel better. Third, entrepreneurial spirit. Coming up with a fresh way of looking at, at processes that the rest of us only wish we had thought of first. Everything can get better, and I cannot be a top-down idea generator. It's got to come from, from the people on the front lines. And then fourth, integrity. Having the judgment to do the right thing, even when it's not in your own self-interest, even when no one else is looking. So that's our mirror. And if something doesn't feel right about someone's behavior, it's almost inevitable that we're going to be able to say, you know that thing about excellence? You made a commitment that in honoring your work yesterday, flawed though it may be, you were going to figure out a way to do it even better today. Consistently, you've not been doing that. And then the other thing, Tony, is we make a chart, and it's the, it's the can, can't, will, won't chart. And you can just make a little graph, and you start on the left with can, and then all the way to the right, you go can't. Start at the top with will, and you go to the bottom, and you go won't. And now you've got can and will, can and can't, will and won't, and I can't remember the other one right now. <laughs> you guys can draw this down. But every single one of those quadrants applies to my behavior on a given day. Ooh. And if it's, if it's a will and can, then our job to reinforce that behavior is to celebrate it always. If the answer is can but won't, all right, we got an attitude issue right there, but not a capability issue, then my job is to inspire. And I'm going to be, I'm not going to have a long leash on someone who can, but they won't. Too many organizations put up with culture-defeating behaviors because the guy's so good at what, right. what he or she does. Right. That doesn't work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. So you work so hard to make sure you get the right nature to start with, and if you're wrong and the correction doesn't work, you make changes, it sounds like, rapidly. Always have to. And, and you know, the reason that I called my book Setting the Table is that when I first opened Union Square Cafe, for whatever silly reason, I decided that the salt shaker should sit right in the center of the table. And the fact is, life always is moving that salt shaker around. And I just have to, we, we have something we call constant gentle pressure. You just got to constantly push that salt shaker back to the center. You don't get angry at it. You don't get angry at life. You don't get angry at the people who moved it. You just push it right back. And I just don't think that there's a greater center of the table than culture because it gets off and you're in trouble. That's beautiful. But I love Can it. I just share one thing? React. You stay centered about it because it's going to be part of the process. Anytime you build something, entropy begins. But you, you move it. You don't get upset about it. But you keep it back in the center of the table. What were you about to say? Well, I was going to say um, I heard this great quote from the uh, athletic director at UCLA, and they've got a Hall of Fame. Anyone from UCLA? Of course you are. So you guys have an athletic Hall of Fame at UCLA because you've won more championships than any other university in every kind of sport. And the, someone asked the athletic director, so what do you attribute to? And guess what? He said, culture. And he said, culture is, is just like a baby. You got to watch it 24-7. You got to change it. No, you got to feed it at least seven times a day. <laughs> and, when it makes, and when it makes a mess, you better clean it up immediately. <laughs> That's great. I thought that That's was awesome. great. Let's have a hand for that. That's awesome. Really good. I was, um, I was reading the book Culture Code. Um, I think it's Daniel Coyle, if I remember right. And you were written up in there, and you talked about your vulnerability as one of the principles there, that you acknowledge when it's not working immediately, that it's no bullshit, it's truth, but you also don't tolerate keeping it that way. Tell us a little about your leadership philosophy. You kind of are by telling us about your culture, but what, is, what makes a great leader in any of your organizations, and how do you, how do you inspire those qualities or find those qualities? I think, I think a great leader, first and foremost, has to express what success looks like. Where are we going and what does success look like? And how are you supposed to behave while you're getting there? And consistently shine your light. I kind of look, look at it like the Statue of Liberty with the, with the beacon. And any time you do something really well according to what we agreed you're going to do, I'm going to shine the light on you. 
Anytime anything good happens for our company, I'm going to shine the light on you. Anytime you screw up, I need to shine it on both of us. Mm. And anytime I screw up, it's going to be squarely in my face. And I think leaders who do that make it safe to make mistakes. Mm. I will put up with any mistake that does not lack integrity because I think that's where some of our greatest learning great comes principle. from. Great um, principle. But I also think that, that you've got to use your leader fire in many ways. So one is a way to light the way for others. One is the way to shine the light on you. But another way to do it is uh, you, you got to have fire in the belly. Do you guys think you understand that here? I think you understand what fire in the belly is like here. And, and sometimes leaders can, uh, what you have right here is a bonfire, and that's where we all have something in common. You've got to look for those common celebrations. But sometimes there's even time for a campfire. And what a campfire is, there's only four or five of us. There's not 4,000 of us. A leader sometimes needs to take three or four people and have a campfire where you get a little bit more intimate. Yes. What the leader's doing at that point, though, is taking the fire out of your belly, yeah. trusting that by putting it here where we don't have a power differential, it can bring us all together. If you do that too often, though, other people on the team are going to get jealous that they were not invited with their marshmallows. <laughs> and when you're sleeping in the tent, they could put out your fire. So you got to use that campfire. And of course, sometimes you use your fire to warm somebody who needs it. Yep. And sometimes you got to use your campfire to singe somebody because they betrayed your principles. Mm. And how I would say that... How long do you tolerate a betrayal of principles? Well, I was going to say, if, if I have uh, the one part of my own leadership that I would criticize the most... And like everybody else, you take your greatest strength too far and it becomes a weakness, is my patience is probably, my, the wick on my candle is sometimes a little bit too long. And that's why I created that will, won't, can, can't, because I wanted to give myself and our Wait team a, yeah. a better sense of what we agree the time frame will be for somebody who's either, who can't do it, or who won't skill do it. issue or won't do it. Which yeah, is and I, I'll always try to move. If, if someone is willing and they've got a great HQ, but they're not a great right fielder, I'll try them at, at third base. You just, yeah. you just never know. Yeah, and training sometimes can solve that if they have that psychology and emotion there. Um, tell me, you know, Shake Shack, you, you took some time. In fact, one of your books, or I think it was on your books, I read somewhere you said, slow down was the secret to success. And I think it was 10 years, if I remember right, after your first uh, restaurant before you opened. Uh, Shake Shack, I think it was five years, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Before you opened another Shake Shack. Right. Tell us what you mean by go slow to succeed, and why did you take so long in these situations? Well, there's, there's really two reasons. I, I do believe that one of the, the things we're all confronting right now is that everything is moving so fast. We all multitask. We're all like going from app to app and phone call to phone call. That I, don't, I think we've lost some of the art of growing where you're planted. And I think when you grow where you're planted, you get to set your roots. And when you set your roots, you get more nutrients. And I think the fruit tastes a whole lot better. Grapevines know that. And so that was one reason. I really, you know, Shake Shack was an accident. It was never meant to be a big public company. Can you amplify that? Because it's, most people don't realize it started in the park, as I understand it, as a, like a hot dog cart. Yeah, it was a hot dog cart. And we, we did that because an artist, we brought an artist to Madison Square Park to beautify the park and make it safe to come there. And this artist from Thailand said, you know, along with my four taxi cabs on stilts, I want there to be a working hot dog cart. And we said, well, we'll be glad to do it. I wanted to test out the theory of hospitality. Could you, was hospitality just for fancy restaurants or could you do it with a hot dog cart? And so we picked Chicago style hot dogs because they've got eight toppings. And I wanted to see if our team could say, oh, that's the guy that likes everything except neon relish. Nobody should like neon relish. That's the person who likes everything except pickles and mustard. And lo and behold, we'd have 100 people waiting in the line. Wow. And uh, so we, we did it. 9-11 happened. The city was obviously depressed. And in 2002, the second summer, the art was gone, but the community said, please bring back the hot dog cart. They did the same thing in 2003. By 2004, we said, what about, what about creating this as a permanent kiosk? So we gifted this kiosk to Madison Square Park philanthropically, and we said, we'll own the business. You be the landlord, and if this thing works, we'll bring people to the park to keep it safe. The rent will go back into the park, and wouldn't you know it, 
this little thing called Shake Shack, lines and lines and lines of people. This day, which is now, uh, Shake Shack will be 15 years old this year. Madison Square Park, we got a public company out of it. Madison Square Park gets just about $1 million in rent just wow, from that one that's shack. That's awesome. That's incredible. What's that I have for that? Uh, that's incredible. So, but the, I'd say the second reason uh, that, uh, that I really, really took my time is that growing up in St. Louis, my dad, who was a really, really gifted entrepreneur, unfortunately didn't do a great job of surrounding himself with really talented people. And every time he grew without a foundation of talented people, something bad happened. And I watched him go bankrupt twice. And I don't know if anyone's ever had that experience of sitting in the living room watching your dad, who's your hero, start to cry in front of the whole family and putting all that, you know, that real vulnerability. Here's, here's the, you know, your hero in life. Yeah. And I just said, I, I'm never going to let that happen. And unfortunately, it wasn't until he died at the age of 59 um, from cancer that I actually allowed myself to believe that you can expand without going out of business. Wow. You just have to do it a different way. Wow. So going slow served you at that stage. Tell people a little bit of the story. So you start with Shake Shack in the park. Now it's a public company. How many facilities do you, what's your revenues? And, and how, what, do you, what is the real separation of Shake Shack from so many other fast food places? You've kind of amplified a little bit about hospitality, but what do you think that specific of all your restaurants, why has that taken off to the level it has? Yeah, why is it that last week when Shake Shack opened its first shack in, in uh, Shanghai, the line of people was 1,000 people long to get in. Wow. And that's exactly what happened in Seoul, Korea. That's exactly what happened in Tokyo. That's exactly what happened, believe it or not, in Saudi Arabia. And it's, it's, a, it's a good question, Tony, because obviously we did not invent burgers and shakes and fries, and we won't be the last people doing it. But it really proves to me that if you take something that people already know, and you, you cook it better than they knew it could be, and you treat them better than they knew they could be treated, and you create a mission so that the people who come to work there truly understand why they're coming to work, yes. and they're rooting for each other. And when Shake Shack went public, 100% of all the employees, many of whom had never had a job before Shake Shack, were given the opportunity to buy the stock at the strike price, wow. which at that time was $21. And then every manager was given stock options, and unlike the rest of us, they were not locked up. And I can't tell you how gratifying it is when you can meet someone and they say, you know, my college loans, I was intending to be paying that for eight years. It's done. You know, I never thought I could put my kid in college. Now I can. That's so, awesome. That's really beautiful. Feels good. Mm. I saw you kind of look at yourself, uh, the language I read somewhere is that you look at yourself as kind of the executive producer of, of these restaurants. Tell us what that means. Well, you do your homework. This is good. <laughs> well, what that means is this, and, and you know, as each one of us, as we grow our business, has to understand that the, the, the license to grow is letting go. It's truly finding people at every step of the way. As you grow, you are, by definition, even you, you're taking on things you've never done before. Not a doubt. Your company was not this big a year ago as it is today. Correct. So by definition, it's a different set of challenges for you. And so each time we grow, my license to get there is to make sure to, to go over my lawn, manicure my lawn. That's what I call it. And what that means is look, take inventory of every single thing that I do all day and ask myself, of all the things I do today, what are those things that someone else could do at least as well or better than I could? And I've got to give them the chance to do that. And then constantly say, and what are those things that only I can do in that way? And the good news is that that list is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's why, unlike my first restaurant when I was 27, where I was the screenwriter and the stage director <laughs> and the best actor and the director. Now I'm the executive producer. And what that means to me is I'm responsible for picking the things we do and don't do. I'm responsible for picking the key talent 
right? I'm, I'm not going to give up picking the chefs of our restaurant and the, the general managers of the restaurant and the architects and obviously the concepts of our restaurant and sometimes even the art on the walls, but I got to I got to stand back and I've got to let other people grow. And for me, that's the fun of, of what I do right now. And then we talked about that on the first day here because most people become the artist. They become the, not that they become the operator. They're not the owner. And he just gave you a beautiful set of steps. I hope you heard that. The simple questions you can ask so that you can begin to scale more impact by seeing who can you replace yourself with. It's really simple, really elegant. Danny, what, uh, what would, what would uh, you want to tell a brand new entrepreneur who's just getting in any business, not necessarily hospitality, what would the two or three things that you think are most important for any business to succeed? I think, I think you got to love the topic. Um, I, think, I think what all entrepreneurs have in common is that there's this idea that solves a problem for people and it makes them feel so happy that they just cannot wait to share that with other people. You just have to. And you cannot see failure as a possibility. As a matter of fact, I believe all entrepreneurs are upsided, right? We only see up. We don't see down. We don't know what could go wrong. As a matter of fact, it's going to be a key uh, skill set to surround yourself with somebody who could see what could go wrong without being your editor while you're dreaming your great dream. That's a really, really important thing. I also think it's critically important now that you, you've got this topic that you love that's going to solve other people's problem, is that you, you say, nothing makes me happier than watching what my product does for people. Mm -hmm. I'm the weird guy. If you were ever go to City Field where the Mets play, where we've got four different ways you can eat, they're all out in center field where no one ever used to go. Mm -hmm. Now people come to City Field early just for the purpose of eating. I'm the weird guy wearing the hat and the glasses lurking around watching people eating our food. And I'm just, I just love how happy it makes them. Just That's makes awesome. me feel great. And then the third thing I'd say, besides you should take pleasure in what your product does for other people, is you just gotta, you just gotta be willing to work because the, we're in a day and age where the second you do have a good idea, the whole world knows it. Someone's gonna tweet about it, Instagram it. Um, by the way, my being here today, wait till you see what it does for your social following. What will do it? No, just kidding. <laughs> he didn't even hear it. I didn't understand. You said you're what? I said my being here today is going to up your social I'm following. Sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> um, it will. No, what I was going to say is you just, I, there's no substitute for hard work and execution. You guys have been saying that for the entire five days here, but the minute the word gets out that you're so good at what you do, Someone will copy you. Everyone in the world is now walking around with their pocket plagiarizer, yeah. takes pictures of things within two seconds. If I, if I taste a great dish somewhere, it's going to be on my chef's desk in two seconds. Yeah. If I see a great flower display, it's going to be on the florist's desk in two seconds. Yeah. Right? So if i gotta, I, I got to keep working, and I've got to keep getting those first 49 yards. But ladies and gentlemen, you cannot win with a 51-point hospitality win, but you can't win with 49 either. Yeah. And so we're tr constantly trying to win on both of those fronts. And if you keep it, you know, it's not just working, it's the way you work is you're constantly innovating. So it's not doing the same thing over and over again, because it's like if somebody's coming and they're copying you, you know, when they get to where you are, they'll be where you were if you keep growing. And that's really what you've done. Exactly what will happen. So we cannot stop innovating, but we have to realize that the shelf life of innovation has gone from three years to about three minutes. Yeah, that's very so true. Let's have three questions for Danny. Who's got a question? How about over there in the red? Yes, sir. Give me a hand. Give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, us all day. Um, the Big Tony. Thank you so much for the transformation that you've caused in our life. Being a big brother, hey. being a father, being an uncle, being in all those places for us that have been down spiritually, personally emotionally and monetarily <laughs> and uh, many of us our businesses are saved from bankruptcy marriages from divorce um, we love you we honor you and we thank you thank big you hand for much. tony thank you 
How about you, thank you. You did it, but I'm glad I got to help a little bit. But everybody here, you did it. I don't ever have the delusion I did it. So don't you have that delusion either. But thank you. I appreciate the acknowledgement. And I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, now for the question. Sorry about that uh, derailment there. For many years in business that you've been, it seems like every next level that we get to, oh, all these challenges are over. I'm pretty good. It's like things are going good. There's nothing I can take. And bang, something comes from the back that you don't expect that maybe the city gives some new tax or there's thwart intention all over the place. And then you get to a point saying, well, I realize it'll never end. There'll be something else that will be there and you'll have to get over that. But then there's that little feeling inside yourself that you're really pissed off and you got to get past that. You must have had so many of those feelings, but it comes to a time, and I just want to know from experience, when something that big happens, the derail, let's say they close the public company, and I was, okay, what am I going to do now? What is the initial feeling you get, and how do you move past that? And how fast can you move past that? Two, two ways I'd answer the question. Number one is we do not have enough. I'm going to use my surfing metaphor again. I want to be a championship surfer. I have to be the guy that chooses to get in the water. I need waves or I can't be, a, I may as well be in a bathtub. The only way to distinguish myself as being a championship surfer is that while everybody else is getting knocked off their surfboard by a tough wave, I'm, I'm doing the Tony Robbins thing. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm showing you how it's done. So as long as, as long as those challenges are meted out in a universal way, I'll go toe to toe with any other business. Was I happy when I learned that the New York City Department of Health was gonna be putting letter grades on the windows of every restaurant? Of course I wasn't happy. But you know what? If, if everybody's gotta do it, we'll win. But there's one other way I look at it. Whoever wrote the rule that we can't get out ahead of some of these things and actually lead the entire industry? 1990, the year after my dad died, or the year he died, I got so pissed off at walking home from work smelling like an ashtray from our, from our guests, or being in between a fight for the last person in no smoking and the first person in smoking, yes. that I just said, we're eliminating smoking in our restaurants. 12 years later, it became law in New York City. Amen. During those 12 years, but I just want to say, during those 12 years, consistently, the restaurant association said, if this is ever law, no one will ever go to restaurants anymore. No one will ever go to bars anymore. Everyone will start going to New Jersey where you can still smoke. Guess what? It didn't happen. All right, here's another one. I didn't wait for there to be a no smoking ban. We also didn't wait for there to be any kind of legislation with respect to tipping in restaurants. We eliminating tipping starting in 2015. And I believe as of this week, 100% of our restaurants are no tipping. And there's a, I, I could spend all day, which we don't have, explaining why I think tipping actually holds people back in their careers and it makes it hard for career growth. But we didn't wait for that to be a general industry trend. We said, this is important to us and this is why we're gonna do it. So A, the bad stuff happens, whether it's weather. Do I like snowstorms in New York? No, I, I'm the Grinch that stole snow. I hate it because it screws up our business. Do I like recessions? I don't think so. But as long as we're all dealing with the same things, we're going to win because of our culture. Can you, uh, can you amplify just one? I don't want to know you out of the time, and I know we got to keep it tight to get you out of here. What's one reason why you decided against tipping and why you believe it limited growth in someone's career? Just give us one perspective. I think that's fascinating. Well, because the very, th the very thing that, that you think you're doing to help somebody um, by giving a 15 or 20 or 25% tip is actually preventing somebody from promoting their life beyond that. Also, in most states, tips are not legally able to be shared with cooks. And so you give someone a 20% tip, the person you give the tip to invariably is sharing it with all the other servers. That's what they tend to do. They're mostly pool houses. Every time prices go up on the menu, they get a 20% raise. The cooks get nothing. And over the course of my career, I've just gotten tired of being a hypocrite where I say, 
We put our employees first, but we really only put our tipped employees first because our cooks, as a discrepancy, are, are getting about 25% more today than they got in 1985, whereas our tipped employees are making about 300% as much. Wow. Now, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy with that. But even that 300% is like a drug, and they can't Promote, they can't promote their career to be a manager after that because the managers in restaurants often make less money than tipped employees. Wow, that's wild. So we idea. looked at all that stuff and we said it's, it's not sustainable. Um, we need to get great people who look at the profession and they say, I want to do this for my career. And so now the people who work in our restaurants, when someone's really nice to you, you know it's like the Japanese word omotenashi, which is the pleasure I get in anticipating your needs and providing that hospitality without expectation of further compensation makes it all the more genuine. Absolutely. And you can be sure if you come to any of our places, that's what it is. Get to have a hand for that. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. Based on time, let's stand up and stretch. Based on time, let's give this man a huge hand, first of all. And if you want to sit there and see you.